Welcome everybody to this Digital Frontiers Institute uh, webinar. On the call as participants today, we have uh, quite a mix of students uh, and alumni. Uh, we've got people joining us from the league and LinkedIn. We've got uh, folks that are in the mobile money course currently, uh, those that are in the leading markets course currently, as this topic uh, is quite broad and does cover a number of um, a number of not only trainings, but a number of topics across the board. Welcome to our alumni that aren't in the training and are joining for, uh, for this call as well. Today, uh, as our guest, uh, we have um, Chiku, who is the general manager from Team M Pamba uh, in uh, Malawi. Uh, as you know, we have a case study on uh, Malawi. Uh, that talks about how mobile money has evolved over time, specifically looking at um, use cases, uh, mobile money use cases. Uh, thank you for joining us today, uh, Chiku. Um, and thank you for giving us your time and your expertise. I know that you're a busy man. Um, today's, discussion you, is, uh, today's discussion is about how mobile money is evolving in Africa. And really with uh, Malawi as a, a focus point to focus our conversation, but we can go, we can go broader than that, uh, uh, Chiku. So maybe just as uh, we, we kick off, um, could you give us an update on how uh, Malawi is doing broadly on mobile money? What does the broad ecosystem look like? Um, have there been any significant changes in deployments, penetration, regulatory landscape, or anything uh, of that uh, recently. Keeping in mind that the case that we have in the course uh, is now about four years old, it will be interesting to hear specifically about the market, and then perhaps you can give us some um, pointers on how uh, uh, Mpamba specifically is doing and what has changed over the last uh, over the last while. Uh, thank you, Gavin, and welcome, everybody. Uh, it, it's great to have this discussion uh, this afternoon. Uh, as, as Gavin has rightly put it, uh, mobile money in Malawi in particular is not the same uh, what we are seeing today than was four years ago. Uh, the, the, the case study which was done indicated that quite a number of things were not uh, in place, uh, regardless of uh, what we had as our wish list as operators. Uh, but also as uh, what, what we are the customer needs then. Uh, also on the other side, uh, the regression is changing by the day. What we had at that point in time and what we have today uh, uh, is quite different. So things are changing, uh, but what I can say in a nutshell is uh, uh, things are getting better. They are changing for the better. So for example, if you focus on the regulatory side, uh, there have been quite a number of changes that we have seen over the, the, the past four years. Uh, I'll just mention like maybe three that we have seen uh, in, uh, uh, in the past uh, maybe 18 to 24 months. One of the challenges which Malawi was facing for quite a long time was uh, the customer identification. Uh, we did not have a national ID uh, until uh, um, uh, towards the end of 2017. And much of the work was actually done uh, last year. So in, in, uh, by 2017, we saw in production of uh, uh, the national ID, and this immediately followed uh, the mandatory center registration. So you, you can no longer just go off the street and get uh, uh, a SIM card and start using it. And this obviously has had a huge bearing, a huge impact uh, on, on, on us as mobile money operators. And, and greatly in the positive way, uh, because at every point in time, it's important to get to know which customers are we transacting with, uh, and, and that helps us to offer them more. Again, when we look at the regulatory space, uh, quite a number of pieces of legislation have been issued over the past uh, two years. Most notably, uh, we had the e-money regulation, which came uh, into force on the, on the 1st of uh, July. This year, uh, it, it brings a couple of uh, changes on board. Uh, one of which is that, uh, unlike before, when the interest which we which uh, is earned on trust accounts, which are run by mobile money operators, 
uh, was being used to implement different corporate social responsibility initiatives. This is now going uh, uh, as interest to customers. So we actually had our first payout of interest uh, to mobile money customers uh, just uh, last week. Uh, so it, it, it brings that particular change in terms of how the, the, the interest is used, but also how the interest in itself is managed, how we look at dormant customers, how do we treat them, and so on. Uh, uh, but also another important piece of uh, legislation which was issued uh, towards the end of 2018 in particular was that uh, as, as operators, mobile money uh, business needs to be regulated separately and directly. So there was a directive issued uh, uh, which led to the linking of mobile money business operations from the GSM business. So that's why today we are talking of TNM Bamba Limited, which is uh, uh, a subsidiary of TNM PLC, uh, which is the phone company. So the, the, the two are uh, basically different. So you, you can see within four years, I've just tried to touch on the surface, but there's quite a lot that has changed <coughs> in the space. But quickly, if you look at uh, the ecosystem in itself, the major players now uh, still remain Skin and Bamba Limited and the actual money. Uh, but we still have got uh, uh, Zona providing over the counter services. So Zona is uh, a company which is also mainly operating in Zambia, uh, but they are doing mainly uh, over the counter uh, services. And there are a few other smaller players, uh, especially the, the, the influx of fintechs and uh, you know, a few startups which, which would want to do a couple of initiatives. Uh, we, we, are, we have seen so many people now coming on board to say uh, we have got a number of initiatives or we have got a number of payment solutions which we think uh, uh, are dependent on uh, what mobile money operators are providing as, as uh, businesses. In terms of the customer base, it's grown a lot. Uh, we are, when you look at the central bank cumulated reports, we are now talking of more than 6 million subscribers at the end of uh, 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 the second quarter of this year. Uh, and out of that customer base, we are now looking at uh, about 49% of them being active in 90 days. Uh, and uh, we are looking at about uh, 45,000 agents uh, servicing the two major mobile money operators countrywide. So maybe if, uh, if I can pause there for now, uh, but just to highlight that a lot has, uh, has really changed uh, over the past uh, four years. Uh, Chigu, thanks thanks for that. I just want to, um, uh, first of all, one of the uh, participants have asked you to speak closer to the microphone if you can, or maybe just a little bit louder. But let me just, okay. uh, uh, that, was a, that was a great um, uh, overview in terms of not only uh, where, the, where the market is now, um, but what are some of the changes. I just want to clarify a, a few of those points and then ask you some questions before we go into Mpanda specifically. Um, so yeah. Six million uh, subscribers. What was the active percentage? I didn't get that. 49%. 49%. Well, that's quite yeah. good. Right? Yeah, uh, that's in 90 days. Yeah, so 49% active on a 6 million uh, base of roughly 3 million consumers, and that's yeah. 90 days uh, Ninety days active. Uh, Chris Statham is asking, is it 30 days, but it's 90 days, uh, 90 days active. 45,000 uh, 45, agents um, uh, in terms of the agent, uh, uh, agent, market, uh, agent market side. The regulations that you mentioned that were changing or some changes in the um, uh, maybe the infrastructure environment uh, that's there. Uh, you mentioned a national ID that was deployed in 2017, um, uh, which is only last or year before last. How is that going in terms of penetration? And has that made it more difficult or easier for the business? Uh, I, I would say this has been one positive introduction uh, to, to the landscape and it has made our work far much easier. So for example, when we talk of onboarding, uh, almost everyone now has got a national ID and it's, uh, it's far much easier for us to identify them. Uh, but also it has brought that, uh, that stickiness or the affinity because, uh, for example, 
if it's starting from this actual SIM card registration, because someone knows that they need a card for them to be on the uh, mobile money service, uh, the stickness it's there because someone knows that this is a card that is registered in my name, and uh, right. I have to give here because this is a particular number that I own. So that directly helps us uh, because also people are more willing and more inclined to be active with their card and ensure that they maintain it at the point in time. And um, is is that a national ID system digital in any way or integrated? Uh, can you digitally confirm the person's uh, identity number against their name, against any kind of database, or is it still very much card-based? Uh, so it, it, it's been a long process, Gavin. Uh, it's, a, it's been a long journey. As I, as I indicated, we, we are quite behind. Uh, we, the card is quite good and it's very cheap. Uh, the, 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 the database is managed by the National Registration Bureau, and already there are initiatives which are, are being done jointly uh, between various stakeholders. And uh, uh, one of the things which uh, which started I think about three months ago is uh, to enable the, the verification uh, component that you have just mentioned. Uh, but what has happened is uh, different players, uh, because they are also banks and other financial institutions uh, who are in need or who are in use of the sale. Uh, they, are, they have given leeway whereby you can have one on one uh, entities having to be able to get access or to, to, to integrate with the National Registration Bureau and be able to do the verification real time. Uh, but eventually, uh, as time goes, we will converge and uh, uh, all the systems should be able to tap or to benefit from the national database. I just want to remind everyone to please raise your questions in the Q&A box below. as it'll just be easier for us to manage them than having to look at, um, to having to look at the chat box and uh, the Q&A box. But I'll try, and, I'll try and catch them both. Kombi, I've seen you. Uh, Yananga, I've seen you. Uh, and of course, Derek, uh, your questions uh, uh, that are coming up in the Q&A box, I've seen you and I'll come to them. I'll come to them in just a little bit. So just to let you know that I've, uh, I've seen you. Okay, so um, uh, Chiku, I mean, it sounds like a rapid rollout and quite a deep penetration. Um, and so, you know, from, uh, from uh, perhaps the next step is some form of an eKYC or some form of an integration into the centralized system uh, that KYC can be, uh, can be checked uh, in a digital way. You mentioned an e-money regulation. Now, is the e-money regulation, or, or talk to us a little bit about how mobile money providers are regulated in the market. Uh, and that'll also help answer Derek's question, which says, does uh, Malawi have a law or regulatory guidelines for mobile money operation or fintech operations specifically, or is this covered in the e-money regulation? So talk a little bit about the licensing requirements uh, for, uh, for mobile money providers. Right, so there, there, there are a couple of uh, legal instruments which, of course, are all talking to each other, uh, but the, the e-money regulation practically gives you uh, uh, quite a lot in terms of uh, what, uh, what one needs to do. Uh, so in terms of the licensing, the, the Reserve Bank uh, or the Central Bank is the one which is responsible for issuing uh, the license. So as I said, uh, initially we are just operating on, a, on like on a letter of no objection, but now you need to get an actual license for you to be able to, right. yeah, to, to operate uh, as a mobile money operator. Uh, but there, there are a couple of other instruments which are all talking to the to the to the e-money regression. Uh, but the central bank also issues different directives from time to time, uh, which are all aimed at you know uh, making the space manageable and uh, good for everyone. Uh, but in whatever you are doing, quite critical uh, are players like uh, uh, the Communications Regulatory Authority, uh, but also the Financial Intelligence Authority, uh, which uh, gives guidance on quite a number of issues uh, to make sure that everything is done within the law, uh, particularly if you think of um, AML and uh, CFT uh, issues. Right. So that's what you were saying earlier about this delinking of the mobile money operations from the TNM. Oh, or from the, the, the mobile network. The GSM business. Yes. From the GSM network, which is, which is quite interesting. Um, 
So uh, what you're saying is that by separating the two, it puts that separated mobile money entity into an environment where it can apply for a license. The license that it's applying for, is it an e-money license or is it a specific mobile money, um, uh, mobile money license? In the regulator's mind, is that two different things or the same thing? Um, so, so the, the one beautiful thing, Gavin, that I'll mention about Malawi is that uh, uh, from the regulator point of view, there's always a lot of consultation, mostly when most of the things are being done. I, I, I recall we had this discussion before to say heavily regulated uh, industries or, or places are actually stifled innovation. So what is happening this side is that uh, the, the central bank drives uh, almost everything, uh, but their emphasis at every point in time is to always encourage innovation and make sure that there are as many more players as possible uh, on the market or in the industry, uh, but that everything is done within the confines of, uh, uh, of the, uh, the operating uh, 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 the, the e-money regulation. But from time to time, depending on what needs to be done, they may issue specific uh, like directives uh, which would take care of certain emerging issues. Okay. Okay, good. So turning now to the interest question that we got from Derek. So uh, I think we've answered the first of Derek's um, uh, questions. Um, uh, turning now to the interest question that Derek had, uh, he was interested in what rate of interest is being paid by the mobile money players. Okay, so, so basically how it works is, I uh, remember we have got trust accounts, uh, for, 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 for one to operate the mobile money business, you have got trust accounts. And these trust accounts are sitting in various commercial banks, so they facilitate the various transactions that we are doing, uh, because the law here says, uh, whatever electronic cash uh, you are dealing with should be backed by fiscal cash. So, so the fiscal cash is sitting in a commercial bank and it earns uh, interest. So it's incumbent upon the mobile money operator to negotiate uh, the interest rates which is payable in those accounts. So you negotiate that with the uh, various commercial banks where you, 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 you have got your trust accounts. So uh, at the end of every quarter, you, you, you declare as the central bank uh, how much is available. Uh, and uh, there, there, are, there are a few items where uh, uh, cost, cost items, uh, which are taken off the total interest which has been earned. Uh, uh, and then whatever is remaining from there is the amount that is shared to the uh, active customers for that period. So, uh, there isn't uh, one definite amount that I would, that, that, that I would mention uh, uh, to say this is the rate which is applicable uh, because the interest rates have also been fluctuating, mm. uh, fluctuating in the economy. But on average, an interest account uh, would do in, um, maybe in the range of 5 to 12% interest. So it, it, it varies and, and, and it's the way our economy has been operating. At times, it's been changing every month or every two months. Okay. A um, <clears throat> couple more questions on regulation, and, and uh, we can move on to some of these more uh, specific questions that I'm seeing coming around from Pamba. Um, so, is there, a regu uh, is there a taxation on mobile money transactions in Malawi? <laughs> Yeah, quite, quite, quite interesting uh, because uh, just in the budget which has been uh, passed uh, uh, to cover the, the government fiscal year from the 1st of uh, July, there was actually an interesting introduction uh, which was 1% uh, tax, uh, which was to be levied on uh, the value of every single transaction that, uh, that a customer was supposed to be doing. Uh, I'm sure. Uh, most of the team is already thinking of the Uganda case, the Zimbabwe case, and a few others. Suffice to say that uh, with concerted efforts from so many players, uh, we had a discussion with the Minister of uh, Economic Planning, uh, the, the, the Reserve Bank, and, and so many other stakeholders. Mm. <clears throat> and uh, there has been a rethink uh, uh, that the one percent has not uh, been applied uh, because uh, uh, the thinking was that this was going to uh, to 
make access of uh, financial services uh, even more costly. Uh, but there are a number of taxes which are, are, are levied on the service providers. So obviously we are looking at the, the value added tax uh, which is charged. Uh, and uh, obviously the corporate tax uh, and, uh, and um, yeah, and, and a few other uh, items which are basically there. But most interesting is the one percent tax, which was to be uh, introduced on usage. Uh, the most, the biggest problem being that this was going to be in, uh, in a, a tax which would be charged uh, a couple of times. So, for example, if I put uh, one dollar that I have in my wallet, uh, I would get taxed the moment I, I cash in that amount. Uh, but also on my subsequent transactions, I also end up being taxed uh, on the same. Okay. So um, just looking through these questions here, Chiku, just to round off the regulatory questions, I've got an interesting one coming in from um, hmm, Francis Mombella, who's wanting to understand how, how is the regulation concerning foreign innovations in Malawi or foreign investors. So if there were a, a foreign owned mobile network operator or mobile money operator that wants to launch uh, in, uh, in the market, are they treated differently? Are they, are they allowed? Um, so for, I mean, how is Zona treated? Does Zona have to have a local, in, a local company set up? Uh, uh, are there any competing mobile network operators that have had to uh, change their legal structure in order to offer the services? Uh, well, Gavin, honestly, I, I, I wouldn't give a very uh, comprehensive answer on that. I think it's something that I would have to take a, a closer look at and, and, and possibly share the, the more specifics of how it's, uh, it's working. And, uh, and I, I wouldn't mind if you was to uh, contact me directly so that I, I okay. provide more clarity to him. But suffice to say that uh, it depends on the service that uh, one is providing. So, so, for example, if we talk of uh, something like international remittance, uh, let's say you're an international remittance company, but you want to operate in Malawi. So there will be certain greater requirements which you have to obtain in your own right, uh, even before you can, uh, you can work on the ground. But most likely, there are, there are some cases where you may have to partner uh, with someone else on the ground. Or you may mm. feel uh, to fulfill certain requirements of maybe working with others uh, who are on the ground. But I would wish to to take a closer look at that particular question, and I'd be more than willing even to give them uh, pointers as to who in the regulatory space uh, should be able to assist them accordingly. Okay. Um, just to call out that uh, Lira is saying that the Central Bank of Lesotho is also considering separating the mobile money issuer business from the GSM business. And we know that this is a move that's happening in Kenya as well. Um, I think as mobile money gets bigger uh, and bigger, we do have to start and where it exists within a mobile network operator or a GSM uh, company, we do have to start questioning what is the nature of the GSM's business. Is it a telco or is it a financial service provider? And up until now, as Combi uh, has pointed out in his question, uh, there, there were, has been some confusion in some markets in terms of who regulates it if it's mobile network operator led. Is it the tel uh, telecom or the, the reserve bank? Chiku, from what I understand from you, that is even with the separation uh, of the mobile money business from the telco business, that is firmly the central bank that, uh, that uh, governs the space. Uh, the e-money regulation comes from the uh, from finance regulation, not from telecoms regulation. Is that, yeah. have I understood that correctly? Yes. Yeah, yeah, Gavin, my quick reaction would be that you cannot totally uh, separate the two, but it only makes sense that uh, the, the, the financial services industry the creator should be the one who is responsible for this, for these are purely digital financial services, and uh, you shouldn't really just look at it from the uh, communications regulation point of view. Yeah. So the separation, in a way, makes a lot of sense, and, and there are so many things which are uh, far much easier to achieve, and uh, innovation and everything else is, is faster uh, than in the case uh, uh, where the two are, uh, are still combined. Yeah. 
So, um, Chiku, let me move to uh, Mpamba specifically, um, uh, as we have many questions about uh, the service. So, let me dig in a little bit based on the questions that are uh, that are coming up. From Candice, um, uh, before I come to Peter, I've noted you are the first on the list there, uh, but uh, I'll come back to you uh, with ex the excellent questions that you have. But the quick fire questions, uh, of the 45,000 Kiko agents, how many of those are Mpamba agents or how many of those specifically support Mpamba? <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I guess you will allow me not to to, to go very deep into that one uh, because I'll be giving out some information yes, which I shouldn't be giving. Uh, but the only thing I can mention is if you look at Mpamba in particular, the, uh, from our agent base, we've got 90% and believe it, it's 90% which is active in 30 days. So that's not uh, an easy number to get. Yeah, okay. but, I, but I wouldn't give the specifics to say what are the active numbers that we have in terms of our agents. But the 90 days versus uh, the, the about, I mean, the 90% versus about the 55%, which we had about four years ago, uh, tells you that we have created more reason for our agents to exist and for them yeah. to be happy. So then, um, the, I mean, that's an interesting one. So in quite a few markets, we see the mobile network operators using the size of their agent network as a competitive element. So instead of what you're saying, instead of declaring the size of your uh, network, what you're doing is relying on the visibility of the network to the consumer to feel uh, to feel that you're uh, that you're uh, present. How are you? Uh, what is your recruitment and management strategy of agents? Is that do you directly recruit your agents? Do you go through aggregators? Are you focusing on retail change? Is there a specific? You know, does Mpamba have a specific? Uh, a strategy around the recruitment and management of uh, agents? So we, we, we go for a hybrid approach uh, for, for, for a number of reasons. Uh, uh, Malawi operates differently from different geographic area to the other. So what we have looked at is to have a hybrid approach. So there are, there, there are spaces where we have, uh, for example, uh, greatly relied on uh, a super agent uh, who is able to uh, recruit some some agents under him and transact accordingly. But what we believe in is, it's not just a, a question of the numbers to say how many agents do you have, uh, but there are a couple of many other things. So you can have, for example, 80,000 agents as a number, but if a customer has to walk to five of them before you can find either cash or economic value, they don't cost them. So we, we believe in a hybrid approach. Uh, uh, we, we are yet to roll out the master agents model in full, uh, but we are basically we basically rely more on ordinary and super agents. So the super agents basically just being uh, wholesalers uh, who can also resell to an ordinary agent. But our emphasis at every point in time is to ensure that in every single area it is covered at least by a reasonable number of agents, and they should be actively trading at every point in time. They should be visible. They should be easily identified by customers. Right. Okay. Let's go to Peter's question. So, uh, you know, quite an interesting one is, um, how are you managing your dormant accounts? So what kind of policies do you have in place for dormant accounts? So uh, could you touch on the period of dormancy and what happens uh, uh, to, um, uh, you know, what are your responsibilities during that period, has the regulator prescripted what happens to funds still in dormant accounts, uh, et cetera? So, just what are, you know, what is what is the general policy in the market around the management of customers' dormant accounts? Okay, so what what we do here, uh, there's the regulator aspect. Maybe I should start from there, and then uh, that would give you a picture of why, as a company, of uh, adopted certain general principles. So the, 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 the regulation, if you look at the e-money uh, uh, regulation that I talked about earlier, stipulates that any account which is inactive, and uh, by inactive, we, we, we actually exclude, for example, where we, dis we are dispersing uh, the interest that I was referring to. So if you receive interest uh, that has been paid, uh, 
uh, for being in the scheme, that will not be considered as, a, as an activity. So if you receive and uh, that's it, you don't do an activity, uh, after a certain period, you'll be deemed dormant. So what the recreation says is, if there is no activity on that particular account uh, for a year, that's 365 days, then that is deemed uh, 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 an account uh, which is dormant. So what basically happens is every mobile, you know, mobile money operator has got an account at the reserve bank, and uh, all the funds uh, which are available in, uh, in the dormant accounts have to be moved now to the uh, account which is held at the central bank. As you are moving that, you have to be very specific. You have to be clear in terms of who are the customers uh, who are dormant, what values are they sitting in, uh, they are they sitting on at the time of the transfer, and uh, you have to make sure that all that information is available uh, because what, what, what it provides is uh, should those customers come back within a stipulated period of time and claim that I had uh, money which was available uh, in, my, in my account, uh, you then impress upon the central bank and within a period of 14 days, if my memory serves me right, uh, the central bank would have sent back that money so that it goes back to the customer. Again, there's a scenario whereby, for example, uh, for whatever reason, maybe an account uh, was dormant or a number has been changed or replaced on the GSM site, you should still maintain a wallet uh, where the information for that particular number is available uh, so that should a customer come claiming for the sale, they should be able to access what was there. But at the same time, a new customer who may adopt a new number should be able to also register and transact using that now, what we have done as a, as, as a service provider in managing this, by the time someone is reaching 365 days, there should be good enough reasons or you, or, 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 or you must have totally failed uh, to give them reason enough to exist on your network. So we are tracking our numbers in 30 days in terms of the activity, uh, then graduating to 60 days, then going to 90 days. And from the system point of view, what we have done is that uh, there are alerts uh, which are put in the system. So for example, if you are inactive for like 60 days, uh, you, as a customer, you get a trigger to say uh, your account will deactivate in such, such a period. So often we will notice that the, the, the consumer behavior is such that the moment they get that particular alert, uh, they are able to react and make their account active again. But also there are specific uh, promotion activities and things like that which we do whereby we target customers that we have noted that uh, are displaying certain behaviors or certain traits. And you will find that uh, when you do those behaviors, normally you provoke them to come active again. And very finally, what we also do is to make sure that the use cases which we are providing uh, should be taking into account why are certain customers not active? Possibly we are not giving them reason enough uh, or we are not answering the certain needs which they have uh, for right. them to be in service. So Chigu, just to, there was a question expanding on that. Uh, if a customer, let's say a customer is only using it as a savings product and yes. they make one deposit and in, yes, in, uh, in a year of time, in a year's time, they haven't made a deposit. Is that an active or an inactive account? But they, 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 they have an investment uh, which is still uh, on an account. Yeah. So it will depend on where the investment is sitting. Uh, there are two scenarios there. Uh, the first scenario would be, let's say, where we have got a unit trust. So if you have got a unit trust and you make an investment, this specific investment is sitting slightly outside the system. Yeah. Uh, because we are physically moving the money which was in your wallet, or you are moving yeah. it and creating the unit trust scheme. So that right. is slightly different from uh, where, the, where you are providing uh, like a saving, uh, like a wallet uh, which, is, uh, which is within the system. So I think the, the treatment will differ depending on that. Uh, but internally, uh, for, for, for the accounts uh, where there is such an investment and it is uh, earning, it, 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 it is earning something, uh, for the one year which is 
uh, outside the regulatory requirement, we will still treat that as an active account. We cannot change it. Right. Okay. Good stuff. So I think that answers that question. How, you know, what is Combi's question is, you know, how widespread are the use cases for mobile money apart from cash in, cash out? Which really goes back to the the, the, the case the, 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 um, yes. and you know what is really motivating the consumers to keep money in their accounts. Okay, so if I can give you a very quick picture of where we are, uh, twenty thirteen we are just looking at uh, cash in, cash out, person to person transfer, pay bill, yes, although it's not very popular, uh, and then the airtime top up. Uh, a year or so later, then we 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 emphasized on the pay bills and uh, introduced the merchant payments. Although these have not really grown to the levels that we desire, uh, but uh, a few years down the line, basically looking at last year to now, uh, number one uh, worth mentioning is that uh, the P two P transfers. Now we are we, we are putting interoperability because in the regulatory front. A directive was issued as well last year, uh, which we are happy with. Uh, so now you can share money between the two mobile network operators, uh, uh, but also with some banks. But this is happening uh, uh, via a national switch. Uh, but uh, in terms of the usage, going back to the cases, now we have got the investments, uh, we have got uh, the savings, uh, we, we have got uh, the ability to withdraw from uh, uh, from an ATM of a bank, but withdrawing from your mobile money wallet, uh, you're able to push your money to the bank or to push from the bank to the wallet. Uh, but also, we have got uh, savings and uh, sorry, uh, credit products. So, if you look at the customer base that we are saving, majority of them are at the bottom of the pyramid, uh, and uh, they would not ordinarily be able to access certain services like uh, credit in a bank. Uh, but over the, over the past year or so, customers are now able to uh, access some, uh, some, some little reasonable amounts of money uh, mm. and then transact. But uh, very finally, there are also some use cases which are non-traditional, uh, things like insurance. Uh, it's now available to mobile money service providers. Uh, but also uh, uh, things like betting, uh, which would not be seemingly maybe for just for a certain class or through certain channels. Right. So you can see that the, 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 the ecosystem is expanding quite a lot. I see the ecosystem is expanding. What of credit though? So is digital credit being handled? Are customers subject to credit reference bureau checks? Uh, is it being regulated, uh, mobile? I mean, credit through mobile money providers, and that's a question from from Henry. Yeah. So basically, before you introduce these uh, uh, services, you need to get clearance from the central bank, and and often the advice is most of them uh, they are done with uh, with, uh, uh, with, uh, with a bank or or a, or a licensed deposit statement institution, uh, which will, uh, will take the risk. So you need so the credit needs to come from a licensed financial institution. In, 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 in general, in general terms, yes, it does. But uh, there, 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 there are a few other things which I, I may not speak fully. But uh, yeah. uh, just just to give people pointers, uh, some of the things which are coming up are things like uh, overdraft services, and it depends on how you classify that and how you handle it. Uh, yeah, yeah, but. Well, uh, Unfortunately, there are some of them are things still in the kitchen, and I can't yeah. give too much information about them. It'll be interesting to see how that evolves. So we see places like Bangladesh that have actual credit regulators that are uh, regulating credit different from uh, uh, licensing. Uh, but I think in a way that that makes sense. And what I'm understanding from you is that the credit, uh, the ability to issue credit or being a licensed financial service provider is separate from the e-money uh, the e-money license. Piku, how many uh, are mobile money service providers allowed to have multiple trust accounts within a single institution or multiple trust accounts across institutions? So are they regulatorily 
allowed to have multiple trust accounts? And is that a common thing in Malawi? Yeah, you, 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 you can have different uh, trust accounts. And, uh, you can have a number within the same bank or across different banks. Uh, but the only guiding, uh, 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 the only guidance which they give around that is that you cannot keep more than 50% uh, of your total value uh, in one single bank. So if you hit the 50% threshold uh, to manage the customer's risk, uh, then they, they, you have to recognize that account within the allowable okay. period of time to ensure that you spread the risk and you push the risk to other banks. Okay. So in Malawi, what you're saying is that the regulator is actually managing the risk by stipulating that you need to spread your trust accounts across multiple financial institutions at a ratio of at least one to one, so at least 50%, uh, no, at maximum 50% of your- Maximum 50% in, 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 in one entity. And this should be only banks, people's taking banks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. Le how is Mpamba managing liquidity specifically uh, in the agent uh, network and specifically in rural areas? So day-to-day -day liquidity management, is there, you know, how are you handling uh, cash liquidity, float and cash liquidity? Uh, liquidity, I think, shall always remain uh, one big challenge that every operator faces. What we have done, I think, are three interventions which I have seen working. Uh, number one is that as we are engaging our agents, uh, we, 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 we have got agreements with every single agent that we sign, and uh, without necessarily gagging them, uh, uh, there are they are, they are indications as to how much they need to have uh, as a minimum or as recommended for them to be able to trade as an agent. And then from time to time, we do some monitoring around that. Uh, so for it, it also depends on what outlet you're operating. So for example, if we give you a boost from where you're operating or you're operating in your own premises and so on, the amounts vary as well. Uh, or if you are, you are, you are a super agent, the wholesaler, uh, we also we also regret the minimum amounts that you can transact with. So my take has always been without uh, being unnecessarily too strict with it, but you, as an operator, you need to give guidance in terms of what you expect your agents uh, uh, to have as a minimum for them to transact. Uh, number two, it is uh, the usage of the operations team uh, in terms of the daily monitoring. Well, the system tells you a lot who is sitting on what value. Now, over time, you are able to gauge to say, uh, uh, if this guy is sitting on so much money, most likely, I mean, in so much electronic value, most likely you should be able to be sitting on so much cash. So you need to, uh, to analyze your trends, know them and make sure that you are uh, able to, to balance them. Number three, which I have found to be the most critical and answers directly to the issue of rural uh, versus uh, urban, I look at it in a slightly different way. It shouldn't just be rural versus urban, but you should also look at the economic activity, which is predominant in that particular area and um, the seasonality factors. So there are places and times wherever you have got money moving from towns to rural areas. For example, where yeah, it's, it's produce time and you expect people to buy things. You expect to have a lot of cash in the rural areas. And, and uh, if it's the lean period, then it's the reverse. So one of the key strategies which I have seen working now is the partnerships. Like in our case, we know that there are areas where uh, if I give an example, there, there could be merchants or there could be certain operators who traditionally struggle because they get a lot of cash within their premises. And they need to get that cash so that it should find itself in a bank. Now, when you strike partnerships with such type of operators, you relieve them of their problem of having cash by giving it to your agents, which is an easier problem to manage because they are not transacting with every single customer or every single consumer. So you, you are finding an easy avenue of getting cash in certain areas because there are people whose business will give them cash and they struggle to use things like CIT. 
On the other hand, we have got uh, other partnerships, uh, for example, we say international remittance companies. So we know that for the international remittance companies, in the areas where we need uh, 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 more cash, the international remittance company uh, will go and, uh, first and, and send the electronic values and people can go and redeem the electronic values from uh, those particular outlets. So you just need to strike a balance and make sure that you strike the right partnerships. There are some businesses which uh, do not look good, but if they provide what you are exactly looking for, then go for it. But at the same time, whilst cash is not desirable, you also need to look at your use cases. So there are certain few things which you may allow your agents to do uh, uh, in a controlled manner. So things like a customer uh, paying for a bill at an agent, which, as I've said, should be done in a controlled manner because ideally you want a customer to get electronic value and do everything by themselves. But if you do it in a controlled manner, there will always be certain customers who go and uh, bring cash to the agent. So you also use that cash in facilitating the needs of another customer. Okay. So I've got four questions here, two on interoperability and two about future uh, uh, future looking. Um, so let's cover the ones on interoperability first from Peter and Kombe. So two different directions there, Chiku. One is on interoperability across other networks. Uh, you mentioned that there, uh, or you mentioned interoperability across uh, networks. Are there interchange fees, or how how uh, how are the how is the interoperability actually working on a P two P transaction? Yeah, so there's uh, there's uh, uh, a convenience fee which is paid. Um, just to give some background, uh, as I said, this is being facilitated by a national switch. And as mobile network operators, we were uh, integrated with the switch uh, quite late than the banks. I think we joined when the banks were there for quite some time. And there are some things where, uh, uh, which you may need to bear in mind or to consider. Uh, uh, good enough, our discussions have been very fruitful and uh, we are given a stick uh, on the switch just like everyone else. Uh, so we have put some, some, some uh, shareholder there as well. Uh, but in a nutshell, uh, there, there, there are convenience fees which the customers are, have to pay, uh, which are more or less in line with uh, 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 customer of Bank A going to withdraw on, on the, an ATM or for Bank B. So there the, the, the are standard fees which are given, but you need now to take those and uh, consider your, uh, your fees. Uh, what is the cost of creating electronic value? What is the cost of cash out and so on? So whatever you are charging, uh, you have to bear in mind that there's a certain portion that uh, you have to, to pay to the switch uh, as the convenience fee. And uh, that is shared between the switch, uh, the originator and the receiver. Right. Uh, and uh, so that convenience fee um, does, and, and working through the national switch, does that also mean that you can transfer money easily from your mobile money account to a bank account? Yeah, so I, I, I must expound a bit on that. Uh, the, the, there have been a couple of bilateral integrations which were there already uh, before we, we, we joined the switch. These were mainly between uh, MROs and banks, uh, which, which would enable uh, our customers to send money to the banks uh, and vice versa. What customers love the most about it is that all the transfers are real time like maybe bank-to-bank -bank, uh, transfer, which may reflect the foreign deal or something like that. Uh, uh, that that's what customers love the most. Uh, in terms of uh, MNO to MNO, everything is via the switch. Uh, but in terms of uh, MNO to the bank or bank to the MNO via the switch, uh, some have already integrated, some have not. Uh, but the central bank is fully in charge of that and their specific timelines which have been given whereby by the end of that time everything uh, should converge and, uh, and go over the switch with the exclusion of transactions which are traditionally not switching or which are traditionally not being provided on the 
the switch. Okay. So, Chigu, uh, I mean, this is uh, fascinating and, and, you know, quite right of you to, um, uh, to have met with me recently to talk about how Malawi has evolved uh, since uh, the case that we did on them some four years ago. It seems like an incredibly mature market in its thinking, in its approaches, in its focus on activation, its focus on getting closer to uh, the customer, in its regulatory practice, practices, which seem to be both uh, protectorate of the consumer as well as welcoming of the innovation and the new, new entrants that are coming into the market. If you're looking forward, based on all of these infrastructure changes from national ID to regulatory changes, e-money regulation, separating um, uh, mobile money operations from telcos, uh, approaches to taxation, uh, regulations supporting savings and, and uh, directives supporting savings on, uh, uh, sorry, interest on savings accounts, etc. There's so much happening in the market and um, with good activation rates, uh, good agent penetration, etc. What role do you see, Lena? Lena's asking, uh, what role do you see Common playing to facilitate the development of financial inclusion still? Um, what key actions are they taking? And um, uh, is there any work that's being done on the user interface related to mobile money um, for use by people at the bottom of the pyramid? So, semi literate people is a question coming from uh, Melissa. So, you know. There's a government angle to my question is, what is government doing to push this even further down the pyramid? And then uh, secondly, you know, where do you see Malawi going into the future? Is there still room for improvements and room for growth? Well, uh, quite a number of issues there and very interesting. Uh, but I must say that uh, government will or the political will is one key factor in as far as uh, taking these things to the next level is concerned. Uh, so, but I must mention that uh, the past one year in particular, uh, there's, there's been a lot of positive strides from both the regulator, but also the, the directly the government and uh, the authorities. One of the key things we have noted, uh, which, which started with uh, uh, the, the, the private entities and government organizations and uh, uh, the international agencies, is that everyone is moving away from cash uh, into electronic, and obviously that gives an opportunity. So unlike before when things like relief aid had to be paid in kind, uh, or, or fiscal cash given to people, everyone now understands that electronic is the way to go. Uh, the missing link obviously was, uh, uh, in our case, government being one of the biggest, or being the biggest payer actually. Uh, how do they work on that? So the Malawi government uh, actually came up with a roadmap of digitizing government payments. So, but there's a there's a cutoff point within which all the government payments have to be digital, uh, and right. we have to make sure that everything is being done uh, in that particular way. Massive opportunity for us. Uh, very good thing to say, but the process obviously uh, will not be as fast as uh, uh, it happen like uh, like in a different uh, industry. But it's something that we have seen working. Uh, there are things like uh, social grants and so on. There are so many discussions going, uh, in progress now. And, and we know that uh, all these uh, are, are going digital. And that's the space in which uh, we are supposed to be playing. However, the environment is changing very, very fast by the day. And you have to make sure that you keep yourself abreast with what is happening. And, and, and you should be up to, up to speed. You should have very good teams. Uh, and make sure that you, are, you understand. Uh, on the other hand, you should also be looking at the risks uh, which are coming to these particular things and make sure that you are, you are able to handle the operation. Now, in terms of incorporating uh, uh, like the interest and so on, the central bank in particular has played a very critical role. Uh, two things which they have done. Number one, they have got uh, a, a, a consumer awareness unit uh, which champions uh, various uh, activities uh, uh, to make sure that customers are aware of uh, what is available, uh, what can go wrong, who should they talk to if anything happens, and so on. Number two, uh, the central bank was very instrumental and came up with what we call the National Task Force on Electronic Payments. 
it's a much central uh, task force uh, as, as operators we are sitting there and there are so many agents the government agencies uh, the central bank itself and so on uh, what they have done is they came up with uh, uh, financial literacy programs it started with having a financial literacy day i think that was about four or five five years ago which eventually graduated into having a financial literacy week uh, which was run for like uh, two or three years and from last year uh, we now have got about six months of uh, serious financial literacy uh, uh, serious financial literacy programs uh, which are undertaken so i found that to be one very important initiative uh, which has uh, uh, greatly helped and uh, it, it, it improves a lot in terms of bringing the awareness and one very critical thing about having it from that national task force is the fact that uh, financial literacy does not have one particular solution because we are looking at various players various different types of customers and their knowledge in terms of uh, digital financial services is different so you need a, an approach whereby you understand what everyone needs uh, 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 the literacy for someone like me uh, would be different from someone who has never used even technology before and so on so the right. concerted effort being driven by the central bank have been very beneficial so the um uh Chiku, we've come to time and thank you for answering uh, uh 24 questions and i see that there are quite a few uh, uh quite a few um or just a handful more um but you know, I just want to sum up by saying uh, that just listening to even the different tactics towards uh, financial literacy or financial education, there seems to be quite a almost symbiotic relationship that's formed between uh, the telcos, mobile money providers, mobile network operators, uh, and um, uh, and the regulator. Right. So it seems to be that you know gone are the days where we're all pulling in opposite directions we seem to be pulling together exactly. um, and um, uh, so you know from that perspective you know, not only congratulate you but congratulate uh, congratulate Malawi and all of the work uh, the work that's been done uh, the work that's been done there um, I think um, what and thank you for being so comprehensive Jill is saying thank you in the comments there but uh, thank you for being so comprehensive in your answers and thank you to the audience for asking uh, so many questions that kept us going today. I think what we'll do with this not only is publish the webinar in um, uh, the league uh, and online, but uh, let's attach this to the case study uh, in the course. So, uh, you know, highlighting that this is where you came from and this is where you've arrived in a matter of four years. That's just phenomenal. Uh, phenomenal growth trajectory and phenomenal uh, story. So Chiku, thank you so much for your time. Thank you everybody for joining. I'm sorry we couldn't get to those last five uh, uh, questions, um, but uh, uh, we appreciate uh, both your time and the audience. Uh, we appreciate your uh, question. Thank you, Gavin, and thanks everyone. And I'm sure if there are any follow-up questions and so on, uh, we can uh, we can always. Uh, talk we need to operate as one global industry and that's the only way we can uh, we can build each other right great maybe if there's outstanding questions if you don't have chiku's contact numbers uh, just ask the questions in the league and uh, chiku can answer those questions online in the league uh, in the linkedin uh, group thank you everybody uh, thank you for your time uh, thank you chiku thank Bye -bye. you